Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. Today on the podcast, we have the pleasure of being joined by Lu Zhang, who is the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund, a venture capital firm with a focus on early stage startups in AI, healthcare, and other cutting edge technologies. A Stanford um, engineering alumni and first generation immigrant from Inner Mongolia, Lu Zhang, her career as a material science researcher before successfully launching a medical device company at the age of 21. She's been featured on Forbes 30 Under 30 and has established herself as a formidable force in the tech and VC industries. Welcome to the show today, Lou. Thank you very much for the introduction. Glad to join the show today. Super excited to have you on, as I mentioned. Um, I wanted to kind of kick this off a little bit and ask you a bit about your journey. I'm wondering if you can kind of walk us through your background and maybe a bit about your journey. You know, you were a material science researcher and then you became, you know, one of the leading venture capitalists um, in the space. How how did that kind of evolve for you? Yeah, thank you. So mention briefly, I'm a a first generation immigrant from Inner Mongolia. So I came to United States in 2010 for a graduate school. So our original plan was really just get my PhD from Stanford for material science and potentially become a professor to make my Asian parents proud. Which okay. didn't happen. Have you ever wanted to start your own podcast? I record and publish podcasts on a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and I absolutely love it. Essentially, you can upload from your phone or computer, and it distributes to every platform that plays podcasts. They support video podcasts, and you can make money on the platform with ads or even podcast subscriptions, something that has made my life so much easier as a podcaster. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you give it a try. You can download the Spotify for Podcast app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your podcast today. A Netflix original film. The Wi-Fi isn't working. In the event of a global communications breakdown, do the following. Stay inside. What just happened here is happening everywhere. Avoid strangers. We've all been deserted. I don't trust them. And most importantly... Do not panic. Julia Roberts. What happens next? Mahershala Ali. I knew something was coming. Leave the world behind. Rated R. Now playing only on Netflix. So, uh, now everyone knows, heard about the ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship in both Silicon Valley and uh, Stanford. So I was really benefiting and also immersed into this experience. One of my patent technology had application for diagnostic of type 2 diabetes. So I was thinking about, okay, this is a great opportunity for leveraging technology innovation to help most of the people. And uh, around that time, it was back in 2010, 2011, where I already applied a lot of the data analysis to help us achieve better, accurate, personalized diagnostic data. So that's my journey of transition from a mature science researcher to an entrepreneur. And once I started a company, of course, I was a very not non-typical diverse background immigrant female solo founder working on the healthcare company and went through the whole journey to bring the company from zero to one. And eventually after I graduated from Stanford with master and a couple of years later, I sold my company to a publicly listed company. Uh, and when I sold it, my ownership was 72%. So not only I was able to get a majority of the financial return, I also was able to have strong negotiation power uh, when I was negotiating this m and deal. That's also the starting point of me thinking about now I have great financial freedom, how I do with this money. I had experience as a founder. I understand how challenge could be for a deep tech and healthcare focused founder to raise money before 2014, 2015. Mm-hmm. I know a great top talent fund. I also want to support founder with immigrant background. So that's how I started to do angel investing, invest in 13 company in total, got four IPO, five more acquisition. And later in 2015, I officially think about building venture capital firm uh, from the scratch, really consider this as uh, the second stage of my pursuit on the career, professional career and also be able to leverage venture capital, leverage early stage investment to support and also bring more good company into the industry. So since 2015, that's what I've been doing, leading fusion fund and investing early stage startup focus on healthcare, AI in healthcare, enterprise AI network and industry automation. That what an incredible background. Um, you know, I think you're just such an inspiring story for so many people that come from other places. I don't come from very far. I'm, I'm from Canada, so I've immigrated to America as well. Um, but yeah, what an inspiring story of someone that has really kind of had this background built and is really kind of pursuing what you're interested in. Something I would love to kind of pick your pick your brain about and hear about is I'm wondering, you know, like what really inspired you to focus on 
um, you know, AI in healthcare? And how did you, you know, how did your experience with your medical device startup kind of shape that focus that you have today? Yeah, so now for me, since I was little, I was also thinking about I want to drive a bigger impact. Later, I was very lucky to find technology innovation uh, as a very effective tool to achieve that goal. So initially, you know, my background was in material science. My research was more focused on not only field sensor, lithium-ion battery, all this hardware stuff. Okay. And when I figured out, okay, there's a really nice application of my tech for the healthcare, that's when I started to build on my passion for healthcare system and also learning. Uh, about this ecosystem in the United States. We all know U.S. healthcare system have 20% of U.S. GDP. A lot of capital investing into this ecosystem, but on the other side too, waste of capital, low efficiency, and people complain, and we also eager to see solve this AAA problem, accessibility, affordable, accuracy problem in healthcare sector. So that I think the fundamental passion for healthcare really make me think about how to solve this AAA issue and other issues within healthcare sector. Later, we found in order to achieve personalized healthcare service provider, personalized diagnostic result, therapeutic solution, digital biology, digital life science, we need to use data. We need to leverage the power of data and also utilize AI as a super effective tool. So now I know AI is a buzzword. We start to invest in AI since 2017 because of focusing AI in healthcare. I published a report in JP Morgan Healthcare Conference Really, just uh, not only just uh, share the knowledge, but also try to encourage more founder and investor joining us to invest in AI in healthcare. Now, I think everyone realized healthcare might be one of the biggest industry opportunity for applying no matter it's AI algorithm or just uh, the buzzword, the generative AI, and it's growing dramatically in the past two years. Yeah, I think uh, that's really incredible. You had that foresight. Um, and that you've been in kind of the space for a while, of course, b- before the hype and kind of the buzz around this space. And I think, yeah, you really you really picked a very solid use case from all of the companies that I cover and the people I talk to. Like healthcare has some phenomenal opportunities for AI. Um, so that must be really exciting for you to, to kind of see that evolving and going. Um, something I would, you know, be curious on asking you about is, you know, as someone who is, you've been both the entrepreneur and also the investor, you've sat on both sides of the table there. What are qualities that you think are, you know, really essential for success in an industry like AI that's, you know, rapidly evolving? Yeah, I know when we talk about AI, of course, you know, algorithm foundation model, whether you have a, one of the best is really important. The good thing is now, no matter is all this API you could directly leverage or using the API built on top of it and to optimize your own model, open source opportunity is really good as well. So I think now it's already different stage of competition. The critical piece for funder to think about with that their differentiation is really about access to data and also domain knowledge for the industry. They're focusing on building up the application because why we choose healthcare. There's another reason is because AI need huge amount of high quality data to train, to do the training in order to show the full capability of AI. And now if you look at all this vertical application. And we need to have high quality data in order to retrain the model, make it industry specific large language model. I will have to even say that after probably GPT 3.5, in order to further optimize the performance of the model, the quality of data matters more than the quantity of the data. Of course, you still need a lot of data, but not necessary. Only important matter quality really matters more. So come back to the founder, whether you have the access to data, whether you have the domain knowledge to persuade, because most of data owned by the large corporate existing industry player, for them to trust you to give you that data set is critical. And essentially building up their own data library. And that will be the true fundamental differentiation of the company. And about, you know, beyond talking only about AI company, I think for AI company, of course, you also want to find the true application solving the industry problem. But I think it's not only for AI. That's a foundation for any startup. You have to solve a real problem. Your technology could look super fancy, sounds really cool, people like it, but people only pay for the thing they really, really need. So how to still have the mindset of solving a fundamental problem, build the AI on top of it, and eventually really align the interest from with the customer user of your solution. I know AI is a buzzword, but we really look at AI as a tool. When we have a new tool, we should use it everywhere in all different industry, different application. But that doesn't mean all the industry application are gonna generate a huge amount of commercial value to make it venture backable. So it's also important choice for founder to make. 
Another thing is really come to the AI competition right now. The good thing is developing cost is much lower. So we not necessarily will see new company need to recruit tons of the junior engineer in order to build up the whole product. They could leverage the co-pilot other AI powered workflow too in order to improve the productivity. But on the other side, having someone senior, senior engineer, tech lead in the team really understand how to build the AI product, how understand the challenge of deploying large language model, how how to solve that challenge is critical. So come back to the founder is also competition of talent. The top talent, the best senior talents is always a smaller pool. So when we look at the company and founder, one thing we we'll always consider is whether they have a strong leadership. And strong leadership, one thing to reflect on that is whether they could attract the best talent to join in the firm. And even if we expand it from there, if the founder has strong leadership, also means this founder have a clear vision and insight about the industry they want to focus in on. How long-term planning in terms of how to design the, the structure of the ground, which type of investor to work with, the valuation number expectation, be able to combine all those things together and make it so attractive to the best talent in the industry. And the, and the beyond all these people and the talent, technology, another thing fundamentally is really choosing the right market and with the right market timing to focus in. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's klaviy dot slash Spotify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so critical, um, that market timing piece and and really finding those those uh, founders with solid leadership um, is critical. And I, you know, I believe from a lot of the the plays and investments you guys have made, um, it's been awesome to kind of watch the success that you've seen uh, with that thesis that you have. Um, I believe Fusion Fund was established back in 2015, right? Um, yeah. I'm curious, like, what are some of the, you know, the most significant changes you've kind of seen in the AI landscape since then? Yes, I think uh, you're right. This is not the first time we have AI as a buzzword. And AI was hot back in 2015, hot again in 2017. Uh, now, again, you know, with the generative AI, everything is going through this digital transformation. I think the first thing is, I think this time the AI trend is real. Because one credit, one big credit, we should give it to a large language model is, is very practical. And uh, make the application so close to commercialization. That's the, also the, the thing we're seeing, like, it's not only for technology industry, all the different industries are integrated with AI right now. And also with ChatGPT, it's like a national education with everyone about what is AI. What does it mean for no-code AI platform? It means you don't need to run a single line of code. You could benefit from AI product. The example is ChatGPT. So I think that's really a big push for the whole industry integration of AI. I, I, oh, at least they're thinking about how to integrate with AI. So I think that's the thing that's evolved much faster than our expectation compared with a couple of years ago. And uh, because of this broader coverage of different industries, that's also another differentiation compared with now with a couple of years ago about AI. Used to be AI more focused on the tech industry specific application use case, more focused on consumer application use cases versus, you know, understand the nature of the data in like life science, pharma, insurance, logistic, um, financial. Lots of this industry are highly regulated. And uh, there's a good thing and bad thing. Bad thing, of course, regulation brings lots of the hurdle for uh, applying new technology. But on the other side, the nature of the data is actually high quality, pretty standardized. Much less okay. work to, to improve the uh, data hygiene and much less work in terms of the screen all the data, fill out the data. So when AI came in to start to utilize all this data, we're going to see dramatic productivity improvement within specific industry. So I do think, you know, 
this time the AI trend might be 10 times bigger than internet. It's not only about the tech sector, but on the other side, uh, that's also a critical question for founder and also investor. I think two thirds of the opportunity within AI belongs to the large corporate. One third belongs to the smaller startup. How to identify the true opportunity for startup is important. Not only just a large corporate owning the technology that also has ownership of the data, but lots of low hanging food and enterprise application later, not only consumer, they may have benefit and advantages as well. And think about all this training data we're using the public field, it will be used up very soon with all this large language model training. The next step will be who will have a higher quality, no matter it's consumer data or industry data, they'll be able to further optimize the model. Yeah, I love that. I think that's uh, that's so critical. And uh, yeah, some incredible changes you've seen kind of in this landscape over the, the last number of years. But like you mentioned, right, there's still these fundamentals that you've kind of been sticking with from the very beginning. Um, and uh, they're, they're still just as applicable today. Something that I would love to ask you a little bit about, right, um, I know, of course, I'm a I'm an immigrant from Canada. It's not very far away from America, um, but I would love. But it definitely plays a role into a little bit of my identity and, and how I think about things as well. I would love to, you know, hear your perspective on this. You know, as a first generation immigrant from, you know, Inner Mongolia, how has your background influenced your perspective on technology and entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think the number one impact is really about having a global perspective. You you know, yes, you're neighbors in Canada, but because you're Canadian came to the United States, you also probably have lots of interaction with other so-called foreigner and immigrant. Yeah. And actually also have Canadian citizenship. I'm member in yeah. 100. You know, that's a good okay. organization you should consider. Uh, it's Canadian 100. It's a local con- yeah. organization. So I think this global perspective play a very important role for the startup founder and investor to think about the scale of the tech application in the future. To be honest, this is not new. Like most of founders in Silicon Valley naturally has a global perspective. Think about the founder you talk to. Nobody, very few of them was talk about, I want to build the greatest company, biggest one in the United States. Everyone's thinking about building a global corporation, which is also the case for most of the tech company in Silicon Valley. But yeah. because of the geopolitical issue in the past couple of years, there's more like domestic century in terms of mindset. I feel immigrant culture still help Silicon Valley continue to maintain this global perspective. When they're yeah. thinking about the diversity of the data, diversity of the use cases, variety of the application opportunity across different continent, not only just in North America, this is critical. Of course, I still think with the AI technology trend, with all this industry application, I think US is the first and the best market uh, for the startup company. But after they grow, you know, within the U.S. market, there's also a bigger opportunity outside U.S. market to continue to uh, grow from there. So I think continue to keep that global perspective is very important. Another thing I feel was uh, immigrant, um, because we came to this country as a foreigner, as a newcomer, we have nothing to be entitled to, and we yeah. have really focused on fundamental of the business. Come back to my journey, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, I to be honest, I had a harder time to raise capital, which also gave me pressure to try to focus on fundamental of the business, how to generate early revenue, how to solve the real problem, of establish very strong partnership early on. I think now with this economy cycle, with the, the kind of reset of valuation in the tech industry, even with the buzzword of AI, we should still continue to focus on fundamental of the business. We have to make sure this company, no matter it's AI company, not AI company, to have a sustainable business model be able to generate blood for themselves. And meanwhile, leverage capital of venture capital firm like us in order to accelerate the growth. That should be the healthy and also standard growth of how founder working with different capital think about the business. Yeah, I think that's so critical. And uh, I think you you really nailed that. Um, I'm wondering, because I know this is kind of a focus for your fund and, and some of the things that you're looking on, looking at, I'm wondering, especially with your background, right, uh, in in kind of the healthcare space, I'm wondering if you can share some insights on how AI is revolutionizing operations and customer experience in the healthcare industry today. Yeah, yeah, there's so many things, you know, think about, uh, give you a couple of examples. For example, one thing, it's not directly to the customer, but also to one of the major player in the healthcare service industry is our physicians. We have this company, they're really, uh, they they're the leader using AI to automate the medical coding. 
I don't know how much you know about medical coding, but whenever you see the doctor, after they do the diagnostic and they engage with you, the doctor have to put in all this coding information in order for patient to file for uh, billing and a reimbursement with the insurance company. This course right. has actually a lot of the valuable time from the physicians. And this a little bit frustrated process is also very boring. And to be honest, AI might be able to, uh, might be able to do a better job than human. So they just uh, tackle this really pinpoint and using AI to automate the whole coding process. And the, one of the co-founder was a former ER physician. So he had the domain expertise in order to really train the model, make it super accurate. They're growing dramatically. So that's just the one piece of the whole healthcare service flow. Think about from the consumer side of the patient engagement. And another thing that's about more kind of a, not that necessary monitoring, but a continuous digital diagnostic. In the future, for us as a patient ourselves, we'll be able to have more efficient and personalized the diagnostic services in the future. And another company I'd like to mention is, you know, during the COVID, we we'll probably all have experience went to a hospital, try to do a CT scan, MR scan, if anyone huh. went to a certain stage. And there's a two choice you could make. One is low resolution scan, very fast, but a lower resolution. Another is a couple hours, high resolution scan. Of course, in order to get high accuracy in terms of diagnostic results, you want to go with high resolution, but it's a couple hours. It's not very pleasant experience just lying there and within the machine with lots of noise to try to get an imaging jet. So we have a company that uses generative AI to upgrade image quality. So basically, they were the first one got FDA approval for medical image enhancement. Oh. So think about now you could go to a hospital, you still get five minutes or a couple minutes medical scan with a CT, MRI, PET, and then the software will upgrade it to high resolution right away. So for user, for patient, we're like better, faster, and cheaper. Another thing is lower radiation exposure, which is also safer. Yeah. For hospital, they improve their capacity. They used to only to do probably three scans per day, and now they probably could do 30 scans per day. So this is also another example of how AI integrated into existing workflow in order to help patient, user side, consumer side, to the hospital side, really align the value and also got lots of uh, value generating. Essentially, I still feel like, I know there are lots of discussion about whether AI is going to replace doctor, nurse, et cetera. I think essential AI is going to still serve as a tool. We'll always need a human in the loop. But we yeah. probably need less human in the loop and lots of things could be done by machine, by AI to improve the productivity and accuracy. And then essentially will provide more higher quality and a more lower cost uh, healthcare service to the whole society. That's amazing. Well, those are some incredible use cases. And, uh, you know, the benefits like you just touched on there, I think are so exciting, which is, you know, lower ho- uh, healthcare costs for all of society. Like that's phenomenal. And um, really, I think the like like you mentioned with AI, it's really going to kind of help alleviate a lot of the um, doctor shortages, nursing shortages that we have um, and really help, you know, solve some of those those problems. Um, so, of course, those are really phenomenal use cases. What I'd love to ask you about, though, is like what are some of the biggest challenges and maybe also opportunities that you see in implementing healthcare in AI? And, you know, maybe especially when it kind of comes to terms like data privacy and other areas like that of are in their thought. Yes, uh, of course, uh, data privacy is always the biggest concern within healthcare as a highly regulated industry. We also invest in vertical AI focus on insurance, financial industry, similar concern. I feel on one side is really the privacy concern. Also, because of the privacy concern, there's another issue with data. Our data owner within healthcare system is the data, data isolation. When we talk about the total amount of data we have in healthcare, that's huge. But on the other side, they're isolated from each other. Like a hospital in California may not share the data with hospital from the East Coast or from Texas. But we essentially we want to have all the data together in order to have a very diverse and also a modern equivalent uh, database to train the model. So there's challenge, but also there's opportunity, as you mentioned. For example, we invest in company doing federated learning. That's a AI algorithm people should research on federated learning. What they do is essentially they enable the data owner. For example, I'm a hospital. I have lots of patient data. I don't necessarily need to technical, physically move out, transfer my data. If I have federal learning in place, then the third party who still train the model on top of my data. So essentially integrate federal learning will enable hospital be able to kind of share, but not physical share 
the data with third party and then enable all this AI solution without actually concern about the liability and the privacy. Another good thing is essentially all different hospitals, their data could find a way to be consolidated uh, in the model training. So feather learning definitely is one of the critical solution there, especially now with the generative AI deployment. It's more important to have a high quality, you know, high quality, huge model data consolidated for the, the uh, for the model training. So that's one thing. Another thing for specific data privacy, we're also looking at a company, we're also invest the company doing the data encryption. So first they're using AI to help you identify what data in your organization are actually sensitive data. Then equip the data from the moment data being collected, then data being uh, transferred and also processed eventually by AI is out with encryption that definitely helps solve the data privacy issue. And moreover, you know, there's also communication challenge within the cloud, different layer, Kubernetes integration will have company help with Kubernetes integration as well, we'll have company focus on edge to computing solution with the cloud. If you have certain critical data processed on the edge devices, also, you don't necessarily need to upload sensitive data to the cloud. So there's more and more technology solution going to help us address the biggest concern within AI and healthcare, which is data privacy and also regulation liability. However, uh, I don't think technology can solve 100% of all the problem. Uh, yeah. We still wanted to see the regulator regulation could tag along and be able to work together with technology solution, provide a better ecosystem for all the innovator, technology owner, and also data. Yeah, I think that's so critical. And it sounds like you're working with some really cool teams and projects on some awesome solutions for, you know, admittedly, some of these big problems that we're grappling with um, in AI today. Um, you know, based off of everything you've everything you've seen and you've been working on, you've been in the space for a long time, I would love to ask you, you know, like, what is some advice that you would give to aspiring entrepreneurs that are looking to make a meaningful impact in the AI space today? Yes, you know, uh, I know impact investment and also ESG has been a really hot topic in the past couple of years. But still come back to running a successful business, I think they still need to find out, the, identify a big enough market, identify a really pinpoint and be able to apply AI in order to solve the problem. That's the fundamental, make something people really need. On the other side, I feel all this impact could bring in by just a simply improve the productivity and saving the cost. And that's also the two major problem in this industry. So if we use that as a definition, you could find if you could identify good use cases within AI, within healthcare, you are definitely making positive impact. Another thing is talk, talk about technology trend. It's not only generative AI within healthcare. Think about what we got from AlphaFold last year for digital biology. Synthetic biology is evolving super fast right now. And regulator is um, also accelerating the process of understanding data, uh, digital diagnosis, digital therapeutics, and digital life science in order to not only giving approval, but working with insurance company and insurance company are start to be ready for doing the reimbursement. So there are lots of things are going on together. So it's important for founder to understand how to also work with different player within the ecosystem. Instead of saying that, oh, I want to bypass FDA because I'm working on something AI. No, you need FDA. You need their endorsement in terms of your technology are legit. And also AI is already well understand by the regulator in terms of the how to use in the clinical application. So embrace and collaborate with all different traditional players within healthcare system. Then they will bring the true impact into the industry. Yeah, I think that's some phenomenal advice um, that uh, is definitely very, very applicable to AI entrepreneurs today. Something else I wanted to ask you about, you know, kind of on the on the technical side. I'm I'm curious from your perspective, what role do you see edge computing in the future of AI and how might it impact sectors like, you know, healthcare and um, enterprise networks? So the first, because we're using more AI, which means we're generating out collecting more data. So edge computing is critical because we don't want to experience really bad data latency. We also want to have a response right away. And not to mention edge computing to help us save the energy consumption for transfer everything to the cloud and the providing potential solution for the data privacy uh, partially. And another thing is the future of AI. We definitely want to deploy AI on the edge devices. Not only just having AI on the computer, web, our cell phone, but how about your microphone? Whether that one could deploy AI become a smart devices. At the time, we definitely need edge computing in order to support uh, the edge AI application. 
So it's critical, and there's so many different layers uh, of the innovation could be done. We've been investing edge computing since 2018. So I have the, the, one of the best edge computing chip company in the portfolio, the best serverless edge solution, uh, you know, working with Akamai and Verizon. We have also cloud edge solution working with a uh, large tech company, help them providing edge capability on the cloud. So this is also very interesting and very important in the industry. So when we look at opportunity within AI, I think people typically think about, oh, build an AI tool, build an AI application. But in order to support all this AI application, we need the whole ecosystem to be ready. So before we process data with AI, we also need a better system to collect the data. So hardware layer is still important matters. And then we need to transfer the data. It means edge computing, all different like a cloud network technology. We need to protect the data. Data privacy solution, eventually we process the data. Even we process the data now with large language model, how to improve the efficiency and lower the cost of running the large language model on so many GPU still come back to optimization on both hardware and software layer. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's phenomenal and that's really cool that you guys had the foresight to kind of get into this since 2018. Um, it's going to be really exciting to see how all of that is kind of implemented. Lou, as we wrap up this interview, I wanted to ask you one last question, which is, Based off of you know your your perspective and where you've been um, and what you're seeing today, where do you see the field of AI heading in say the next five or you know three to five years? Let's say. I think as I mentioned, this is a huge trend. This is a real, and in the next three or five years, we're gonna see AI in integrated with all different industry. I'm talking about very traditional industry: healthcare, pharma, life science, insurance, financial, logistic, chemical manufacturing. And all this industry have something in common that they have, they have historically tons of high quality data being collected, but not being utilized. So now I think all this large industry are thinking about how to build up their data strategy, how to integrate it with uh, the third party AI solution provider. So that's a huge, huge industry opportunity we're seeing. We don't invest in consumer, so I'm not an expert in consumer, but I do think lots of this consumer hype with AI, we eventually want to think about are they sustainable? For example, now you probably pay a couple dollars a month to generate an image where you like it. Okay. But will you generate an image every week, every month in the next 10 years or five years? Is that okay. something really truly people need to have for their day to day? Or is there something cool people want to try out in the beginning? But if it came to the industry, it's a total different story. And while we're talking about AI, another thing I really want to highlight is the, the trend of robotics. Because of COVID, there's so many hardware upgrade as well in the industry. Like we have lots of this factory, they're essentially dark and cold. What does it mean? It means there's still no human on labor state. It's all dark and cold. So robotics gonna play a more and more important role in the industry application. How we better engage it, how we save the cost, how we improve the productivity efficiency. We recently even invested an interesting company providing insurance coverage for robotics application or robotics integration. So right. that would be also something really interesting, really new in the next five years. That's super fascinating. Yeah, I'll have to have you come on again in the future as the whole robotics revolution kind of gets more underway. Um, I see that, you know, the the pairing of AI and robotics is just like a fascinating concept to see where that goes. Exactly. Lou, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, sharing your insights and your story with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. If people want to um, get in contact with you or find out more about, you know, what you're working on, investing in it and looking at what's a good way for them to do that. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and also feel free to go to our website. We also have contact information there. So love to stay in touch closely with you and also with the audience of the podcast. And we're always open to talk with early stage founder. I love your early supporter with you guys. Wonderful. Okay. And to the listener, I'll leave a link in the uh, show notes um, so you could go over to Lou's website. Um, and see what they're working on. Um, but yeah, once again, Lou, thank you so much for coming on the show. To the listener, thank you so much for tuning in to the AI Chat Podcast. Make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts and have a wonderful rest of your day.